Our first speaker, I have to admit, I found by, okay, stalking is a strong word, but friending on Facebook, and just, I fell a little bit or a lot of it in love with her writing, and here we are now, this very moment. Uh, our first speaker at Skepticon 10 is a Washington DC-based writer who is interested in activist culture, radical vulnerability, feminism, race and identity, mass incarceration and climate justice. You can find her work at Everyday Feminism, The Establishment, Huffington Post, TheHumanist.com and Medium. Please welcome to the stage, Jessica Show. Welcome guys, thank you for being here. My talk is called Reading Between the Lines, Navigating the Emotional Truths in Social Justice Discourse. And so, how are you guys doing today? What are you carrying with you? I want you guys to just take one moment to think about the feelings that you may be experiencing right now, how you've gone through this day, what things are on your mind, because all of these things are things that we're carrying with us as we enter this, this talk, right? Um, so just wanted you guys, ooh, I want you guys to check in with yourselves and to notice. Is this anyone's first Skepticon by chance? Oh, awesome, it's my first one too. Um, so I look forward to meeting and hanging out with the rest of you all night. Cool. So today I wanted to chat a little bit about what lies beyond the words, the dynamics that I've seen play out in the social justice conversations that I have. As Lauren mentioned, I am on Facebook all the time, so it makes sense that people stalk and find me through Facebook. I just <laughs> post my thoughts um, and my writing. Um, and so I wanted to talk about those dynamics, the dynamics that also play out in relationships, that play out just because we're humans who are interacting with each other on a pretty daily basis, right? And we use these imprecise symbols of reality that we call language. Uh, so I wanted to bring them to light, to bring them to the forefront of your mind, and I'm sure you've noticed a couple of these things yourselves. And then after that, I will talk about how to cultivate an online community with a robust community of friends. And this is not how to do it like the how-to. This is how I cultivate my online community, which I think is pretty great. I have a profile that hosts real conversations that are generally not super toxic ones. And the, com the community is basically self-regulating. Um, there's a lot of people who I haven't had the pleasure of meeting in person yet who I've considered very close to me already and who I've recognized a lot of the faces of in this very room. Um, but let me, I guess, just tell you a little bit about myself first, and feel free to notice what I'm choosing to tell you, and how I'm telling it, and what narrative I am likely asking you to construct about who I am. Uh, maybe basically how I want to be seen by you guys. I'll try to pair the bare bone kind of factual stuff with some of the most more interesting bits, but it's not. I'll let you guys judge that. So this is me. My name is Jessica Xiao, X-I-A-O. It's like an SH sound, sh shao, like in shower, because a lot of people get this wrong and don't necessarily know how to pronounce it if they're not accustomed to Chinese names or the pinging, which is the romanization of Chinese names in English. I'm a writer, an editor, I'm a millennial. I was born in Pittsburgh to poor people, but I grew up in New North Jersey in an upper middle class suburb that was, that's very close to New York City after my mom and dad, who are formerly Chinese but naturalized Americans, made it so to speak, so I became upper middle class. I have two younger sisters who are both somehow cooler than me, like literally, they always say this to me too. They're funny and they're brilliant and they're caring and I both resent it and I'm very proud of them, but it makes sense, like if you look at these pictures, you know that I am a nerd, I have always been a nerd, look at that nerd face. I spent a lot of time trying to know everything when I was little. I used to make curricula for myself in the summer times when school was out, and sometimes for my sisters, and I would force them to learn with me <laughs> on summer vacations. My parents said that I had something called Tian Tai, and so I've labeled here what, that, what those characters mean, right? Tian means sky, but it also means heavens, and Tai means skill or talent. So together, it's kind of like heavenly mandated talents, God-given gifts, right? So I basically have had to fight these perfectionist procrastinator tendencies that I've developed in childhood after being told I was special and work hard to isolate what fulfillment actually means to me outside of all of these things I'm supposed to be and outside of the structured nature of a classroom where the easiest design of education is for a teacher to deposit information into a passive student. 
I'm really good at that stuff. I was salutatorian in high school. I can remember my high school GPA. I was in most of the honor societies, editor in chief, bunch of choirs, blah, blah, blah. Classic nerd. Okay. But what I've always wanted, it really, is to fit in. My desire for belonging and for seeking community led me to study economics and psychology as my college majors, which I studied at McGill University in Montreal. I figured that money buys social access, and psychology explains our economic decisions. I moved to DC to work for the American Humanist Association, which is how I got more involved in skepticism and humanism. Um, it was upon moving back to the US, actually, and perhaps to the nation's capital, that I started noticing how racist this country is, um, as well as how much oppression I had accepted as status quo, and became more invested in social justice. I also at this time noticed the lack of humanist and secular resources and just lack of kind of interest by the atheist community as a whole to deal with mass incarceration. And after writing about ending of private prison usage in the federal system, I became more interested and started researching it more and writing about it for everyday feminism, among other things. After my time at AHA ended, I traveled for a bit, became even more prolific in ranting on Facebook and things like that. Now I work at Free Minds Book Club and Writing Workshop, which is a nonprofit that serves incarcerated youth, where I have what my colleague says could be the only job title of its kind as the prison book club coordinator, which is really cool. And I'm happy to talk about it afterwards because I could probably not stop talking about it. Um, when I'm not working, I'm off organizing other events, writing, experimenting with nurturing relationships online, as I mentioned, and other life things like dancing, Netflixing, and such. But none of this is the full me. Just a glimpse, and hopefully we can become friends later. If you boil it down, basically I am a human who cares about how equality plays out in reality and how we can respect each other and be happy. So why am I telling you all this? Because I wanted to provide a little bit of context, and I wanted to show you how my personal story drives action. Marshall Gans talks about this a lot. He came up with this idea of story of self. He is a professor, I believe, at the Harvard School of Poli the Harvard Kennedy School of Politics or something like this. But anyway, he was the one who came up with this idea of developing narratives of yourself and connecting them to the public narrative and trying to explain how you yourself, um, in your everyday moments, how all of those things are political. I also want you to notice for yourselves the things that you want to notice um, and come up with your own theories about why I communicate the way that I do because I think that noticing how I communicate will help you guys also reason and think about and notice how you guys communicate yourselves. And all of this kind of thinking and noticing about things will ultimately help us become better communicators, I think. So the most important part of telling you about my personal story is that I think that all of our personal stories matter. Your personal story informs your politics, but it does not have to be politicized. So, I mean, I can still remember being made fun of for my last name in elementary school in the stairwell. Like, I remember the exact stairwell. Um, and I remember the exact sounds he was making with my last name, right? But it's not because of this story that I am now vehemently anti-racist. I knew it was rude and terrible at the time, but racism wasn't a concept that I learned until much later. And I mean, to be fair, when I was in third grade, we had a project where we had to create a product, and I came up with Xiao's Cat Chow. So like, who's the real victim and perpetrator here? OK, it's me. <laughs> That experience hasn't left me, though. And I think that's the important part, right? That experience drives me to not want that experience for anybody else. So how you conceptualize your narrative and your identity affects your engagement in politics. This is fluid and ever-changing, and we can even decide to use our identities, our lived experiences as entities in and of themselves to drive change. Like, if I wanted to use that story and be like, this is my political story and this is why I'm doing things, People do do that. It's exhausting and it's literally objectifying, for example, the hashtag MeToo campaign. Um, but we do do it. The way we imagine ourselves affects the way we approach thinking about our civic duties, the things we care about, and who we care about. So that's why I asked you guys how you're doing and what you're carrying with you today. I want us to sit with these things, the thoughts that ebb and flow and become the present and then leave us. The one word that you brought today the certain pieces of ourselves come into the forefront at various times, and then certain pieces of our identity are also less important at other times or less noticed. Um, but they're always with us. There's no separation between who I am and the things that I say that I stand for. So 
I touched upon my drive to seek love, belonging, and community. I'm also inspired by brilliant people, and I love being surrounded by brilliant people. And by the way, a lot of brilliant people don't really recognize that they are brilliant, nor do they know what my understanding of brilliance is, for which I have my own standards. I love attention, and I love dressing up, and I love and hate the spotlight. So after this, I will probably try and hide for a little bit. But there's no separation between these details: the way I communicate and the why. So we've noticed this: the, the personal is political, the community is in us, and we are each living parts of a community. Let's continue using me as an example, because I like the attention. I want you to acknowledge your own noticing and what informs your formation of judgments,、um, and become attuned to how you've decided to characterize me, because it's not just based on the words that I said. It is based on the personal history that you carry with you, the feelings that you carry with you today, the way I present information, the way I talk, the way I move, the sensations of the world as interpreted by you, your internal experience. Do I calm you? Are you interested? Are you bored? Confused? Are you annoyed? Do you like me? Do I seem approachable? Do I seem like I know what I'm talking about? And Does likability or approachability have to do with any of that? Does my height or appearance or age, or the frequency of my voice affect it? I just want you guys to just notice a couple of these things and and think about what kinds of judgments we're placing on other people. And we do this self-monitoring for ourselves, more or less. And that accuracy is modulated by the impressions of those around us when they make their perceptions of us known. So when people tell us how we appear to them. We kind of factor that into our self-view. So, all this noticing is basically to say that, oh, where did the star go? There's this big star behind the empathy. Anyway, noticing is just—I'm just trying to get us all to apply empathy. Perspective taking is really what I want to talk about. I want us to broaden our spheres of empathy and who we can feel empathy for. But I also want us to deepen our experiences of empathy with other people. So we're just practicing it together, right? We're working out those empathy muscles, no matter where you are in your perspective taking. If this workout is too easy for you, I hope at least you've gotten the chance to practice it a little bit. The more that we notice about ourselves and our responses, the more we can apply these ideas of self-awareness and understanding others in communication. And so, if we want to communicate more precisely, we have to admit our own emotions and to recognize that of others to get why someone is responding in such a way. So, to be honest, I think that this is also affected by our identity. I think a lot of white people need to work a little harder on this, and a lot of men need to work a little bit harder at this, just by virtue of society, the way that we grew up. We have to recognize why we communicate, to what ends. Are we trying to convince somebody? Are we trying to vent our frustration? Are we asking for advice? Sometimes we don't know why, and we don't know why we respond the way that we do either. But with practice at understanding ourselves and the way that we see ourselves and others, we become better at determining these intentions and to approximate the intentions of others as best we can. Right. So we're setting up understanding self and understanding others through empathy. And like I said, how much labor it takes you to get to a certain level of understanding, how much exercise you've had already with empathy,、uh, will determine kind of how how much labor you have to do. Right? The more that you've done it, probably the less work it'll take for now.、Um, and we're just doing this as practice. No, no one is owed any of this. But if you are justice-minded, you might want to take into account. A couple of things about the way you're extending empathy and who you're choosing to extend it to. Cool. So I'm going to use a lot of my Facebook posts in, in my slideshow presentation because I'm lazy and I do not want to write all new material. So here's an example where I said, whenever I do anything defying social norm, I know most others will attribute my behavior to my non-whiteness first, not to my womanhood. Even though I was born and grew up in this country, and they do, this is intersectionality. Empathy makes up a core component of intersectionality. Understanding the evaluative frameworks and how our identities interact with each other, so that and the ways that others see us in those identities, and then the way we behave in relationship. Right? This is a very fluid and interactive thing. This is intersectionality. We're noticing all the ways we work together with all the ways that others are. 
this is very exhausting. Getting attuned to this is a lot of work. But let's also remember this has been done for ages, and this is what I alluded to. The reasons we are in different places with regard to empathy and with understanding is because we've had to do more or less of it. We've had blinders on for longer or shorter periods of time, oftentimes due to how much privilege we've experienced by virtue of the ways we live our lives, our profession, the way our minds are wired. We have different propensities to focus on this. But whether you are intuitively or grew up with more empathy, or you visceral, viscerally can feel it, or that if you have to do it cognitively, I think it can be done. And by this, I mean, you know, whether it comes naturally to you or not, and whether you uh, need to focus more on studying it or practicing it, it can be done. Um, and empathy is kind of the first step to emotional labor, which is the managing of other people's emotions. And this has always required a depth in understanding interactions beyond verbal communication. Awareness of emotion and understanding, how to respond to them in order to generate particular responses. It's usually been considered a soft skill, as you may know. Oh, my bad. Where am I? There we go. Although, basically, nowadays, there is a lot more interest and investment in it, especially with big data and people trying to figure out consumer behavior with a large amount of information at the fingertips of internet companies. But there is historically a difference between who does more emotional labor uh, and in how we value this skill in the US. And practicing emotional labor is an economic decision and a political decision, which like I mentioned, you're not obligated to do anything. Uh, choosing empathy and choosing emotional labor, these are political decisions. So recognize where you are and do accordingly. Um, I just really wanted to throw this in here because the Comey testimonial about the Flynn investigation was really interesting to me. There were so many choice quotes in there that just seemed to, re seemed to demonstrate how senators were forced to recognize statements only at face value, despite the fact that the emotional content uh, and the understandings of interactions between the president and J uh, James Comey had a lot of power dynamics in it and had a lot of emotional content to it. So I put up this particular slide, which I will read. Senator Susan Collins asked, okay, you mentioned that from your very first meeting with the president, you decided to write a memo memorializing the conversation. What was it about that very first meeting that made you write a memo when you have not done that with the previous two statements? To which Comey said, as I said, a combination of things. A gut feeling is an important overlay, but the circumstances that I was alone, the subject matter, and the nature of the person I was interacting with and my read of the person, and really just gut feel laying on top of all of that that this is going to be important to protect this organization that I make records of it. So those questions that were asked of James Comey were really irritating to me because they feigned a lack of understanding of these power dynamics. Um, and so the things that he said, a gut feeling, the nature of the person, the subject matter, this is kind of the realm that I want to discuss because we really haven't developed very good vocabulary around it. Or if there is good vocabulary around it, we are not so in tune with expressing those things. So I'm not sure if it's a real or a faux lack of understanding. I think it's partly social because we just discount our emotions so much. Okay, so now I'll get into a few emotional reactions that I think come with challenges to our identity and how they manifest in our interactions in really not so great ways. Um, and I'm not going to break it down between Trump voters versus non-Trump voters, people who believe in white supremacy and people who don't. Patriarchy exists or patriarchy doesn't. I think that would be an affront to the complexity and range of being human because we all go through cycles of these feelings. And so it would be an injustice to human progress if I just kind of broke it down that way. We can notice these types of cycles of emotions play out in a lot of different situations and it doesn't necessarily have to be political. First, we need to contest this understanding of emotion as the unthought, just as we need to contest the assumption that rational thought is unemotional or that it doesn't involve being moved by others. So it is very logical to take into account emotions and not just to try and rule them out, which I think that we do have a tendency to do, particularly in the humanist atheist skeptic movement. 
This quote was by Sarah Ahmed, who wrote Cultural Politics of Emotion, uh, which I think lays out a really good framework for understanding emotions in terms of politics. Here she talks a little bit more about the history of emotionality, as I alluded to. Feminists who speak out against established truths, she writes, are often constructed as emotional, as failing the very standards of reason and impartiality that are assumed to form the basis of good judgment. This hierarchy clearly translates into a hierarchy between subjects. Whilst thought and reason are identified with the masculine and Western subject, emotions and bodies are associated with femininity and racial others. This projection of emotion onto the body of others not only works to exclude others from the realm of thought and rationality, but also works to conceal the emotional and embodied aspects of thought and reason. So, who has generally performed emotional labor is genderized, and it's reflective in our economy's values, the productivity of women's work, community work, and care work. Emotions expressed by women are also judged as irrational first, rather than perfectly valid responses. That's just talking about women, but, however, this still kind of applies relating emotions as a whole in the face of logic. And so, I want to describe to you this pretty well-known comic online about sea lioning. So, as you can see in the picture, there are two humans who are discussing sea lions, who are saying, I don't mind most marine animals, but sea lions I could do without. And then a sea lion comes up and says, pardon me, I couldn't help but over here. I would like to have a civil conversation about your statement. Would you mind showing me evidence of any negative thing any sea lion has ever done to you? And then the sea lion continues to make these demands for intellectual labor, despite having already violated the boundaries of the humans. In the later panel you see, uh, the sea lion is clearly in this person's house. You made a statement in public for all to hear. Are you unable to defend the statements you make or simply unwilling to have a reasoned discussion? And so this phenomenon became called sea lioning and it's something that is very commonly, uh, it's kind of a common pattern of interaction online. Um, basically, somebody will suggest that they really want to believe you, but they just need a little bit more information, that they are really actually well-intentioned, in, well but they require further evidence. So these are several different ways that plays out, as well as related to sea lion, ways that, things that are related to sea lioning. So I don't believe in white privilege. Please spend lots of time sending me more evidence. I will inevitably refuse to trust because I'm just trying to be well-informed. This is something that has happened to me. There's always, also, this pretense of good intentions is very disingenuous because they will always need more information. And then slightly related but different is the skeptic who always asks for empirical evidence or asks for logic or philosophy. Yeah, I hear you, that guy sounds terrible, but that's just one single terrible person. Do you have any data, though, that it's just all people? This is the main argument behind not all men. Yeah, so people suffered, but communism 100% makes sense. It's just that no country was actually executing communism properly. So applying the theory of communism over the actual lived experiences of people who've experienced it. This is very irritating to me because we are not exactly swayed by statistics or logical arguments, right? We're swayed by whatever it is that we choose to be swayed by as determined by what we value most about our own identities and what is important to us. So if we believe ourselves to be really logical, we will want logic, we will want these things to sway us more. This is the worst though, this is really irritating. And obviously not every form of communication has like the goal of resolving conflict or developing further understanding, but then this one pretends to, right? We'll have to agree to disagree, have a blessed day. This is immediately anger-inducing. Induc if you take it at face value, you're supposed to take it with kindness. If you respond negatively to this, they weaponize the language and say, well, there's no reason to be so rude when I'm being civil, which is invalidating and gaslighting your very valid expression of emotion. So, to be logical is to take into account our emotions, but also to revel in the imperfections and complexities of being alive. We can be swayed by what statistics represent about our values, the idea that evidence is important. 
If we care about evidence, we should ostensibly care about statistics and data collected clinically, methodologically, systematically. Quantitative data feels very safe and robust. It feels very legitimizing. But even that in itself should be challenged. Why do us, some of us take comfort in logicking information rather than logicking humans? Could it be safer and more comfortable than stories? Could it be that we've decided intelligence is a valuable way of sorting humans and have decided one type of human is better than another or more deserving? So I think that to be logical is actually to understand that we're really not. We don't live in an objective reality, even if it exists, because we don't have the same experiences. We have common shared experiences, um, but we ultimately, because of who we are individually, I cannot have the same type of internal and external experience as somebody else, so some of the same ways. Where we grew up, how we were raised, who our friends were, who our neighbors are, TV channels we got or didn't get, whether we lived in a house or apartment, or the suburbs or the slums or the city, or whether we had a TV or not, whether we're non-binary, gender non-conforming, gender fluid, woman or men, all of these things affect how we experience the world and how other people experience us and interact with us. So that's why we have to reflect on the emotional content of our views, because nothing resides outside of emotion, of motivations. We are all a bundle of these preferences and wants and desires shaped by the world around us and interactions with our inner selves. What does it mean, though, to not actually undercut our emotional experiences and responses? We have to dismantle some of what might be culturally ingrained. If you grew up in a society with cis-heteronormative gender roles that ascribe a woman's realm to the personal, the family life, the community, and a man's to economy, production of value, and politics, where for a while, being a feminist even could mean trying to ascribe to male gender norms, to quote-unquote be more logical. Playing a Placing a larger value on logic is a cultural lens that I was also raised in, especially as a non-believer who was never indoctrinated into a formal religion. Formal religion. And so to give emotions a proper investigation is amazing. I think it makes us more analytical, deeper thinkers, we're more exploratory and less rigid. And to speak to the imperfections and complexities of being alive, I am part of this co-founding team of a secret group on Facebook called Allies and Accomplices, and exists for the sole purpose of channeling post-election energy into on-the-ground efforts, and for discussing the nitty-gritty nuances and conflicts of opinion that result when you take theoretical concepts in social justice and try and apply them. And this imperfection is what I'm really curious about and interested in, because humans are by no means theoretical. We're constantly in a struggle to match our ideals and values with our actions, and that cognitive dissonance has really interesting effects, especially if internal consistency is an important and valuable part of your life, if that's something that is really, really integral to your identity. Um, and then I just wanted a chance to share this delightful quote from James Baldwin's The Fire Next Time. To be sensual, I think, is to respect and rejoice in the force of life, of life itself, and to be present in all that one does, from the effort of loving to the baking of bread. It will be a great day for America, incidentally, when we begin to taste, to eat bread again, instead of the blasphemous and tasteless foam rubber that we have substituted for it. I'm not being frivolous now either. Something very sinister happens to the people of a country when they begin to distrust their own emotions and react their own reactions as deeply as they do here and become as joyless as they have become. Okay. So, now I'll actually get to some of these emotions. We experience fear when an existential threat is approaching. We become overprotective and we take ownership of our social spaces as much as possible. So we try and take up as much space as we can. But the sphere has a target, has an object, because something needs to be approaching. If it was just fear of the unknown, it would be generalized anxiety. Um, so this fear also has an impact on the object of the fear, right? And so they take up less social space. And then we often the cycle plays out where we can hate the object of fear for making us fearful or whatever they stand for that makes us uncomfortable. And this us always shifts depending on the object of the fear 
at the time, and then it changes who we decide to hate. We might even experience disgust for them. And disgust is a really, really interesting one because you have to feel like someone is relatable to you somehow and feel a necessity to push them away for some trait you do not want to be associated with but feel that you could be. So disgust requires a relationship with another. But it also requires looking down, creating one position that is holier and one that is lesser. And I think disgust fundamentally comes down to morals, really. And so when I see this situation, I can usually immediately apply it to how it plays out in terms of race and in terms of gender, because those are identities I'm very attuned to as someone who is not of an identity holding the most traditional power in the place that I live and grew up, which is the US. But these dynamics are human ones, so feel free to apply these frameworks with your own scenarios in mind. Here's a poem, Thingy, from Facebook. It uh, expresses how someone might feel othered by fear, uh, by a public narrative that seems to disinclude them for what they represent. My insecurity is living under a white gaze. I only feel as far as you see me. Like echolocation, I need you to see me to verify I'm real. So I paint my face and identify in ways that make you dare to look at me. Socially respectable, but the invisible are true and here. Hashtag white feminism, hashtag not your model minority. However, sometimes we can kind of recognize that this is happening and we may also feel shame for the mistakes that we've made or acknowledge that we've made but shame makes us want to hide or to move on as quickly as possible. Or in the context of a country, it could be the very starting point of transformation if we have a public narrative that focuses on shame. We fell from grace, but we acknowledged it and can move on. But that doesn't mean they even have to fully make reparations for harm or address or understand the cause of harm because shame is a feeling carried and controlled by the perpetrator. The narrator chooses what they believe themselves accountable for. Which is why I think shame and guilt are actually two of the most dangerous emotions when it comes to treating marginalized populations. It can quickly return to disgust and hate and shifting the blame. So these are some of the emotions and how they cycle and relate to each other, and this is what it sometimes causes in social justice, right? There's cognitive dissonance because your very identity is being threatened. And first, you might want to deny this, and so you'll gaslight the people who are suggesting that your identity may not be your ideal identity. You might try and minimize or rewrite history or deflect or actually erase the things that you've done. So here's another James Baldwin quote. Many of them, them being white people, know better, but as you will discover, people find it very difficult to act on what they know. To act is to be committed, and to be committed is to be in danger. In this case, the danger in the minds of most white Americans is the loss of their identity. And so these are the phrases that people use. Stop being divisive. Stop hating us. It's not even that bad anymore. It's all in the past. Get over it. This focus makes the is on the aggressors and not the aggressed. This focus turns the conversation of victimhood onto the ones who are actually doing the oppressing in social justice contexts. And then there's also a lot of striving to move beyond a tainted identity and a destroyed sense of self. For coherency's sake, we might work hard to return to the idealized versions of who we are. In terms of political identities, this gives us people who identify as the good white person, the male feminist, the well-meaning liberal, the definitively not racist. And the really painful thing about people with identities like this is that oftentimes they're striving not for equality and justice, but for their own sense of internal self-worth. Their priorities are misaligned, leading to performative performativity and virtue signal signaling without effectively reducing oppression. So this, is, this can feel very gaslighting to somebody who might be experiencing those positions of uh, la less power, um, especially because there will be people who believe them to actually be well-meaning and good, but that's not enough, especially when it's not actually for the pursuit of equality and justice, but just to make themselves feel better. 
So here's an example of how that plays out, right? The white man. I'm not racist, but saying white people are racist because white supremacy exists and we benefit from it hurts my feelings and makes me not want to fight racism. Social justice needs to fix its messaging, be nicer to me, and be more thankful for my help. I'm super not racist. <laughs> There's a prioritizing here of civility to distract from oppression. And so we need to decide the weighted distribution of our emotions for either side. You can decide you don't like how someone is expressing a point to you, but you can't decide the truth value of what they're saying based on how they're saying it to you. You can only, that depends on the content, right? But some people, when identity is threatened, would prefer to rewrite and make truths more palatable, which minimizes and validates the emotions of those harmed. So no one is obligated to be nice to another person when they're expressing racism when they're expressing their own experiences of oppression. Tone policing here is used to deflect instead of to listen. And then respectability is encouraged so that we can fit activism into molds of palatable transformation. That's, you know, not too scary and not too actually dismantling of white supremacy. And then here's a side note, because I find this, I found this very overwhelming when I first stepped into having these types of conversations online, right? It feels increasingly difficult to express an opinion, to have to think about all these things when we're having a conversation. But is it just actually increasingly difficult to express opinions as three-dimensional facts? There's a difference, and I think that this should inform you accordingly as to how you want to communicate for whatever purpose it is that you are communicating because these personal truths, these lived experiences, they are all very different, and we do have evaluative frameworks. That means that none of what we're expressing is objective reality, so to, so to speak. So I'll end this section with a quote by me, because I want to talk about the way I communicate. I generally err on the side of redemption and restorative justice. My personal communication style is I try to extend kindness. When I notice those dynamics of denial and gaslighting play out, they temper my responses because then I have to make a choice about who I choose to protect when I speak um, and what to prior... Yeah, just basically I need to choose who to protect. So we have the capacity when we hear the expression of a controversial, offensive, socially taboo opinion to change minds, create allies, allow for stories of redemption to emerge and to color our self-narratives with lessons learned instead of polarizing the mistakes that people make. Okay, nurturing your community. So this part is gonna be mostly screenshots of my Facebook because I'm really proud of my Facebook community. But what the heck is a community and what do I mean by that, right? For me, this is the people who we want to engage with and who we care about, um, who care about us and our humanity, regardless of ideology, although ideology often does inform who we want to interact with. And why do I do this? My theory of change, as you may have noticed, is that all spheres of my life are very much integrated, and I want to feel as liberated as possible so that I can f express my full self wherever I go. So. And I like to write and educate and talk things out. I find this really fulfilling. I like to have these types of intense discussions sometimes on my Facebook. I find the experience of community very fulfilling. As I mentioned, I've often tried to find places where I felt like I belonged. So these tips for building and nurturing community are mostly about how to have strong bonds with other people virtually. And so, yeah, also my theory of change is that I am responsible for trying to build the kind of world that I want to live in. And so I need to behave in the ways that I want the world to behave. This means I'm not a preacher. I'm not better than my community. I'm not talking down to them. I'm not lecturing at people. I'm basically just expressing how I feel about things and what I've noticed about different types of current events and how they play out with respect to the ways that we interact with each other in society. So I just, I basically am just me. And uh, so I share who I am. And one of my friends called this radical vulnerability, which I think I understand as vulnerability is really difficult 
in a world that kind of encourages us to be certain types of norms. So to be open is in itself a form of bravery because you are demonstrating all the ways in which you are flawed. And for some reason, we're not really allowed to be that. So I share me. This is a screenshot of what one person said to me about what I do, which is, it's unbelievable. You have the gut to say so many things on your wall. I haven't talked to 80% of my Facebook friends, so no way am I going to share anything private. And uh, I honestly wouldn't have been capable of this just a year ago. And he, this particular individual called it unusual and beautiful at the same time. And then this other picture is a status that I posted where I said, I fight capitalism's information asymmetry and power imbalances with the leveling effect of radical vulnerability. So here's another way that I share, right? What an incredible way to turn your moment of trauma into a living art performance. So I go on these rants about a topic for a week, for example. Just a few days or weeks before the hashtag Me Too thing started, I decided to disclose an event that had occurred to me that feels very similar to what's going on with Louis C.K. right now. Uh, and I went into all of the details of it. That's all I'm going to say about that. <laughs> And then I also talk a lot about my relationships because, like I said, the personal is political, the political is personal. I am an actual person, a human being. I experience things. I date a lot. So here are some of my Tinder statuses. I also did this experiment, which I noticed another one of my friends doing, which was to create online-only virtual events. So I created a, an event to celebrate my 25th birthday online because so many of my friends are all over the place and we couldn't get together in person, but at least we had this space where everybody could celebrate and affirm me. This is something else that, okay, so here's the next part. It's not, to have a reciprocal relationship, right? You have to care and demonstrate care. So not only do you share, do I share me, I actively ask people about themselves and I actively make space for them to share if they so choose. So I started getting a lot of Facebook friend requests this year, I think because I've been more vocal and a little bit more prolific. So I ask people for introductions. And I do this more than once a year. I do this every couple of months or when I feel like there's a lot of new people who are coming onto my wall, just because I want people to feel like they actually can get to know one another. Uh, it's not just for me to interact with each person individually, but it's for all of us to interact with each other. So here's one from August 18th. Here's another one from September 27th. And another introduction thread. And I often put in other little requests in there, like feel free to be self-promotional or use this as a space to compliment other people. Share you. I also did this daily GIF for a while where I asked people questions and had them share with me GIFs. Eventually that extended into writing prompts. Uh, and I just do it on occasion now because daily was way too much work. But I also just check in with people. How are you feeling today? What are you processing? Just yesterday, I think this was yesterday. I don't remember when I pulled the screenshot. But I asked, how is everyone doing today? What are you proud of lately? What do you need from this community? And is there anything else you'd like to share? And then I respond to every single one of those comments that is left there, because I currently still can, um, but because I really want people to feel like they are a part of something and not just witnessing something. I also really believe in gratitude and expressing gratitude to each other. And so here's a post where I express gratitude for the ways that people have told me my ways of sharing have affected them and the way that I use radical vulnerability have affected them and brought insight into their own lives and how it's encouraged them to be more courageous in their sharing and how it's opened up their worlds. So I always thank people as much as I can. And I also always prioritize women. So thank a woman today 
for providing emotional and intellectual labor or anything that has benefited your life in the comments below. So I will make these asks on occasion as well to demonstrate who I care about in my community and who I want to elevate at times. And this, this varies depending on my mood. Affirmations. As I mentioned, I ask people to give compliments to each other. But not just to each other, sometimes I need it too. I am, I hosted, I was part of facilitating an imposter syndrome workshop earlier today, which seems really, what's the word, ironic for someone who has it. Um, but so I will definitely always ask for that too because I think it is terrifying to do some of the things that I do. And people don't realize that I find it terrifying too, but I do them anyway. So I ask for things, I ask for affirmations, and then I also give affirmations. So dear people who took courage today, I notice you, for example. I'm also definitely not afraid to express all the things that I don't know. And I think that it's important to express ourselves with humility and to like I said, again, just not having a top-down community, right? And here I'm expressing situations of identities where I really, I don't know what to do about these types of interactions that play out in activism culture. So I'm just explaining that here. But I also hold myself accountable. So I apologize when I think I've fucked up, when I've noticed that I fucked up. I asked, I posted on Facebook this request for people to talk about cultural appropriation without setting appropriate sorts of safeties in place. My Facebook wall isn't actually a safe space in the academic definition. I don't use content notes as much as I can because I think that some of these conversations can't take place in a space that is made to be safe and prioritize a particular identity. There are other sorts of spaces for that. However, I do try and keep it from being toxic because I want as few people to be harmed from these conversations as possible, right? So I apologize and I apologize. I'm also very real. I think, yeah, you've noticed this already. I basically will tell people that I'm not here to cater to anyone. I am here to be as I am, and that's what you're getting. So you don't owe yourself to anyone. You pick your battles wisely. You do as much as you can. You disengage responsibil responsibly. You're not going to have an opinion on everything. So I've, come, I've tried to come to terms with the fact that not everyone's going to like me and that I don't have to bring everybody into the fold. What, and when I do this, it's not at the exclusion of people of others. I'm just focusing on those who I want to be around and where I can do the most good. I don't need to prove my goodness to anyone. I just want to be who I am. And so I put this big OK there because that's oftentimes how I respond to long paragraphs of text online when someone is telling me that they disagree with me very vehemently and saying things that I really don't care to address because you're not, I first of all don't owe that type of intellectual labor. I might have already identified which ones of those, inter those processes from earlier you are currently engaging in mentally and I don't need to explain myself to those types, right? I had one time this person come on my wall on a public post of mine, not even a Facebook friend or anything. He had heard a podcast I'd done and he just wanted to let me know how much it offended him and how much it offended other people. He's like, I just, I need you to know this, that it offended me. I said, I don't need to register your grievance. I'm not a political office. Okay. So I know this sounds easier said than done, but don't let being afraid of fucking up stop you. In fact, that for me is kind of the reason why I have to work even harder at engaging online responsibly because I have this perpetual fear of harming people by being wrong and it keeps me accountable. Um, and I mean, you probably don't know everything. I don't know everything. Just keep trying if this is really important to you to build this kind of space online and to discuss these things and to help build a better world. Just keep working at it. 
So I will end with this uh, Facebook post that I wrote. Will I? Oh, I'm gonna, I'll read it to you guys, and you guys can tell me if it makes sense, or like decide later, and maybe don't tell me. Against all odds, we still crave deeper connections. We crave accountability with each other, but we tread lightly, testing our steps towards each other in a delicate dance towards trust in a time when intimacy quickly dissolves into depersonalization in the blink of an eye. We brush things off as if lack of accountability doesn't hurt us, as if ghosting isn't painful, as if canceling last minute doesn't sting, as if we don't feel disposable when those actions occur without explanation, whether it's warranted or not. And then when we replicate those behaviors, we do them to other people and say, no sweat, as if we should always expect each other to be on the same page because other people don't deserve an explanation, other people don't deserve kindness or reserves our, of our emotional labor who should just understand at this point? Well, there's a lot of things that we don't deserve, right? And we all draw our own lines on who will invest effort in, whether they deserve it or not, whether fair or not, and nothing is fair but let's make sure we're constantly monitoring where those lines are drawn and accept that they are relationship dependent. I will go long distances literally if I'm getting to know, uh, getting together with someone is just as important to them as it is to me. I don't brush off engagements from an agreed upon and established Tinder date or to a visit out of state if I can help it as a matter of respect, if they respect me. Similarly, there are people who I will not engage about, engage with simply because I don't want to, but someone who loves them should, and prove it by being there to check them on how beholden they are to the very biases and, and holding up oppression, and just hold them. Because investing in each other is still allowed. It's okay to simultaneously decide when you need to disengage and ghost. Recognize what effect that might have on who you're ghosting. And also recognize who you'd be willing to explain yourself to, even if it's an additional exertion of emotional labor. Because we can't keep treating everything as superficially transactional. Because we're not super into capitalism, right? So thanks for spending this time with me.